Today we are testing the Pico Pro Brewing System. Now, if you are a regular watcher of this channel, you know that I typically brew in a more conventional manner. Because I am trying this, it does not mean I am selling out. Uh, it does not mean I am getting out of brewing in the traditional way. I am just giving this a try. Now, full disclosure, the Pico people approached me and made this offer to let me try this equipment and send me some ingredient kits and my initial reaction was that I'm not interested. I wasn't really wanting to try it but then I watched a couple videos, did some more reading and I did develop an interest. So here we are, okay? Now, um, what a lot of people have done and there are videos out there where people document every step of the way. They take this all apart. They they do the, all the details, all the process, so I'm not going to do that. And the other thing is, you can approach it from the question of, can a non-brewer make good beer with this system? I'm going to take a different perspective. My perspective is going to be, can this system make good beer? Um, can someone with my experience, with my awareness and knowledge of brewing in other conventional ways, if I do my best, can I make good beer on this system? So that is what I am going to try to do, and we will see what happens. Now, I will be forthright with my expectations. My expectations are that it will not be as good as beer made in more traditional ways, either good uh, extract beer or all grain. I did have a sample of a Pico beer at Homebrew Con. I did not care for it very much. But I am hopeful. I'm going to hope for the best. Let me talk about the packs that I chose. I have two initially. One is a clone or a uh, version of Deschutes uh, Fresh Squeeze. They call it Half Squeezed. The reason I chose that is I think a lot of people would be interested in making their own beer at home if they could make a fresh hoppy IPA type beer because that is a huge in demand, very popular, and you can't always get them fresh. So I thought, well, let's see what this system can do. The other one I chose is a stronger stout. Uh, again, another beer that people do like to buy and enjoy, um, covering kind of two different ends of the spectrum. Um, and I guess that's about it. I uh, have actually already done all the footage. We've already done the tasting that you'll see at the end of this video. So I'm shooting this intro at the end but you will have to go along for the ride to get there, so let's get started. Okay, so this, the first step is to get the hop packet into the hop cradle, the metal hop cradle right here. Uh, just slips in there, sets down in there. I was noting that when I was uh, smelling over here, I was smelling uh, fresh hops. Uh, here is the grains, and here is this code, which I believe it reads once I get the machine turned on, and that's how it identifies what pack it is, and uh, what instructions, the mashing temperature, water amounts, things like that. So that is the first step. The next step was to put a certain amount of water into this keg and attach the ball locks to the appropriate connections. I also put uh, one gallon of water in this uh, top water reservoir and we'll see what's next. So I picked up the right pack as you can see. Uh, interesting thing is if I turn this knob I can go to adjust recipe and I could increase the bitterness which I've just left it as the default, or I could adjust the alcohol, which must make it somehow either do less wort or more of a sparge. I'm not really sure. I'm just going to leave these as default and start brewing. And uh, I'm, just, I'm not going to detail all this out, but I'm going to click through this and it'll get going. So it's kind of giving me a play-by-play. -play. Uh, earlier it was saying what temperature was at, like 74, 75, and it said heating to uh, 110. Yeah, like this kind of thing. And 
then it gives the expected alcohol and uh, IBU, so it's definitely alive. So it is uh, definitely doing something. It's starting to smell like wort a little bit. You can see a real thin colored uh, wort right there. Um, I went to the website and I found it interesting that when I signed in, it has my progress of my current batch. It has these times down here and we are up to 9.56 and it shows the timeline and then uh, on the left here is a temperature chart. So that I found interesting and I believe you can track this stuff from your phone if you have an app. The other thing that's interesting and I agreed to uh, allow my information to be published but this is a map of uh, the US and it has everybody else who is brewing at this time and oh boy where did I end up here okay that's Wisconsin uh, I did this earlier if I drill in uh, far enough let's see where are we there we are so there is uh, is is mine on the map and as you can see even in the Twin Cities area um, there's a lot of these pins happening right now so kind of interesting you can see where people are brewing you can see how many people are brewing and just a kind of another part of their whole program so it said uh it said mashing oh that's top two huh it said mashing and then it said uh brewing and then i noticed over here there's a out there's a out vent right here and uh, so that must be where the boil happens I'm not sure what the boiling process is to get the um, bitterness I do see that it's at something right now about 204 degrees uh, when it was giving a temperature reading it said something you know like target of 204 so maybe I, I think I mean it uses steam pressure or steam heat. Uh, I'm not really sure about the exact process, but I believe it's uh, doing the boil uh, in the uh, keg. So this is interesting on the website. It just keeps a running total. 13 minutes remaining. It tells you when it will finish. Also, the graph has uh, continued to develop. It has more detail. Uh, you'll see it has dough in mash one of course on the left you see the temperatures mash two mash out then we have hops one two three and then the temperature is higher it's uh around 200 and then what's the last thing hops i guess it's just kind of finishing up here 13 minutes to go the brewing is done. Now they say to cool the keg to 68 degrees and pitch the yeast. What they say is you could just leave it at room temperature, which if you were doing it at night, that could be overnight. I suppose you could put it into a fridge since it's small enough. But what I want to do is get it as cool as possible, uh, as quickly as possible. So I'm going to sanitize a spoon and a thermometer. I'm going to take this lid off. I'm going to gently stir the word around inside to help cool it. I have an ice bath going. I'll take the temperature and I'll try to get it cooled down. So here's the Pico Pack after. And I noticed uh, there's a big indentation in the middle where the water is going. And I also noticed that this grain up here is completely dry. This grain has not even been mashed uh, a little bit of that it's pretty hot um, oh I see we're getting steam um, let me grab a spoon let me dig in here a little bit this stuff is is wet down here but on the sides 
I'm curious. That looks okay over there. The crush uh, looks kind of average. I uh, wouldn't say it's extremely finely crushed. Now that might, sorry for the camera, I'm kind of looking outside. Um, that might be for a reason. That could possibly be too fine of a crush makes this process more difficult. Um, I will take a gravity reading when it gets cooled down, which we're still working on that. And they give me a target original gravity, which I think was 1057 or something. So we'll see how we close we come to that. So I was out here dumping the grains into my compost and I thought I'd take a look at the hops. There's actually quite a few hops in here. There's these got to be quarter ounce, maybe each one. There's three segments here, three more. I don't know what order they were used in. Three more, and that one. There's four additions. There's one, and one, two, three, four, five. So yeah, there's quite a few hops for a like a five liter batch, I would say, and the word does smell good, so we'll see what happens. So I've got it down to 65 degrees. The gravity is about 1052 when uh, I get this settled. That's, that's what I'm gonna call it. I thought I saw somewhere 1057 to get to 6%, so that's not gonna cut it. Uh, possibly, but we'll see. So it's close. So yeah, this is 65. What I'm going to do is I'm sanitizing a whisk here. I'm going to just use that and whip this up a little bit to aerate it. And then I have a packet of dried yeast, which they say just pour in. So I'm going to do that and I'll put an airlock on it and it might be fermenting uh, by this evening. So we are making progress. It is now uh, 10, 28, two weeks after brew day. On the fourth day, I added the dry hops. On the ninth day, I removed the dry hops and I put the whole keg in the fridge so it could cool, crash cool, and it has been in the fridge five days. I took a gravity reading. I have to let it warm up to 60, but at about 40 degrees, it reads about 1015, so I'm guessing that's about 1013. Now, Pico says you can pressure transfer the beer from the brewing keg, fermenting keg, to the serving keg by using something like this. You can either get a CO2 cartridge uh, and do it that way. Of course, you could also just use your regular CO2 ball lock that you may already have. The other thing they suggest you could do is actually use the machine and hook up all the tubing and sort of pump it. But none of those appeal to me as much as just sanitizing some tubing and a racking cane and just siphoning it in there like I usually do. That way I can control the level of clarity as soon as it starts to get uh, closer to the tube. I can pull it and stop the siphon. Uh, so I'm just going to do that. And I'll come back after this when the beer is warmed up and I'll do my initial tasting. So I got it in there nice. I pulled it when it started to get a little bit more uh, dirty. Uh, you know, sludgy coming through. You can see, maybe you can't really see, but there isn't a ton of sediment but it also wasn't a, a huge volume uh if you kind of you can kind of see how high it looks like the croissant was coming up pretty high up in this little keg but there was enough space because i didn't see any stuff coming through the airlock now i'm gonna put it inside of my fridge and force carbonate it at 30 psi for a day or so and then turn it down to 10 and eventually we'll get to try it So after I warmed up, I'm taking the gravity, I'm putting it down at 1013. I've seen other people say 1012 for their half squeeze, so it's close. 
My take on the beer at this point, there's a tiny bit of hop aroma, which I would expect with all the dry hops. But there's something, and it's also not particularly clear. Um, we'll see. I mean, I've done what I've can so far. It's still kind of early. We'll see how it is in the, in the fridge for a week. My take on the flavor is a lot like what I th thought of this sample I had at Homebrew Con of a Pico beer. That, yes, it tastes generally like beer, but it doesn't taste like the good homebrew that I'm used to making and drinking. Also does not taste like the commercial beers that you can buy. There's just something a little bit different. Um, I don't know if it has to do with the process. I don't know how it's boiled. I don't know how the hops are boiled, uh, the bitterness, all that kind of stuff. I'm not really sure how it works in this system. Uh, I still have hope for the final result. And, you know, that's not to say that it's bad or certainly not terrible. Ooh, it's going to be dark in here. But I just am curious to see what uh, the final result will be. And I'll report when we get there. Okay. okay, we're gonna grab a quick sample of the half squeezed for um, tasting purposes. I'm gonna do a little shot here like this. I did uh, over carbonate it. That's my fault. I had had my CO2 on there. I actually have um, the CO2 off now, but it's a, it pours a little foamy. That's my fault, but it's very clear and it does look lovely. All right, here we are. I got all of these people together at one time to taste my uh, first Pico beer that you've seen lots of footage along the way if you've made it this far. Uh, this is the half squeezed. My version got from, it went from 1052 to 1013. They advertise it as 1057 to 1010 at 6.2%, minus 5.1%. We've been drinking and talking about it. The first thing I will say is it is a lovely uh, color and it is also very clear. I mean, it is as clear as you could want in a homebrew. Um, and then you dive in, you, you smell it and you taste it. What are you guys smelling in this beer? There's some butterscotch. And there's some hops. That's you, that's what that's you, what jumps out at me. You can smell the hops. I get the hops after the butterscotch. Okay. The butterscotch is kind of like the uh, Primary. most prominent okay. initial aroma component. Yeah, after yeah. that, there's there's some fruit and little hints of pine, peach and apricot. And hops. I get the cotton. I get the cotton candy though that Chris had mentioned, and I also think that gets kind of muddled in with the butterscotch like once he said that I was like ah, oh, maybe it's not butterscotch it's this kind of like sweet kind of like oxidized caramel sugar flavor so. I also get um, more of a dank sort of sour or even uh, I hate to say it uh, Elsa was trying it she said cappy which is often associated with certain hops, but I kind of also get more of like a gym sock uh, aroma, kind of a... Musty. Kind of an unpleasant aroma that is tied in, I think, with the buttery or butterscotchness. Yeah, I get mostly peach. I didn't get the but, uh, butterscotch right away until you actually said the words, and then I was like, oh yeah. And it kind of coats your tongue and hangs there. I think it, it coats the glass, too, like when you put your nose in there. You can smell it in the lacing a little bit. Mm. Now that I've been drinking it more, if I kind of ignore the sweet butter uh, flavor, I do get the bitter. I do get some bitterness. Mm -hmm. a little bit. It took me a while. I I have drank like this much of this, but uh, I do get some hot bitterness. After all, it's there, and Chris kind of. Uh... I'm gonna steal your thunder. Oh man! <laughs> kind of contributed uh, some kind of like minerally kind of English type character. I don't know if that's the water or yeah, recipe or what, but it's definitely finishing with a bitterness now that it's warm. Like I get more bitter aftertaste now than when it was cold. And on the finish, it seems like not so much on the palate or for me anyway. 
whatever that cotton candy sugar quality is, I get that more in the flavor than in the aroma. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, but it's weird because this beer has had different flavors close. at different times. Like you wait two yeah. minutes, it tastes totally different. Yeah. So this is the Pico. I just thought I would do this just for how they look. They're they're somewhat similar. They, yeah. On camera, they're showing up. The Deschutes is showing up as darker, but when you're just kind of looking at them, they're yeah. kind of similar. My main purpose in this video, as I talked about earlier, is can a person make a good, enjoyable homebrew that he is happy to have, proud of, or she. having made, he or she, um, on this Pico system? Uh, based on this first beer, in conjunction with my years of other homebrewing experience, if I made this beer, I, I would not be particularly happy with it. I would think that uh, I maybe did something wrong. Uh, I don't know what I would speculate that I did wrong. Maybe I would guess uh, fermentation. We were talking off camera that I don't actually know how the system does the boil, um, how it you know gets the word in conjunction with the hops and heats it to a boiling to get the bitterness and the flavor. Also, if there is any kind of a boil thing happening, there is a lid. This, as you, I think you saw, there's the rubber lid that's on. So we were wondering if any of that weird flavor came from, from possibly, possibly from that. From oh. boil steam not being allowed to escape. So you guys are all homebrewers. What, what do you, would you be, what, what's your, you know, just sort of objective opinion on how this tastes? Depending on where I was in my homebrewing career, I probably would not hate this as much as I'm sure some of us could say being like BJCP and brewing for 10 years now. Uh, earlier on, I probably would have, I'd gone for this. Yeah, I think my first been all in. five or 10 batches, if they turned out like this, where, you know, it's clear, um, there's lacing on some people's glasses. It carbonated? Yeah, it carbonated. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd be happy with that for it's my not, first couple of beers, it's, but sorry. I, I would just want my own recipe, so. It's not contaminated. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a bonus. Yeah, there's a lot of ease of use and you know, kind of like user friendliness and having an automated system. Mm -hmm. I think you know whatever issues with fermentation might have arisen. Like uh, I think those can be circumvented with some experience and maybe some aftermarket modifications. Uh, you know, it looks nice. It's certainly drinkable. It's got some things. De <laughs> defect uh, issues. Yes, yeah, I think but that's. They're not. They're not making me put it down. And it is a new system for Don, so maybe it's Don's fault. Yeah, so I did my best. As I also I talk know, about throughout water. this process, I did even above and beyond at times to make it as good of a beer as I could possibly make with this system. And so I think my takeaway is if I was a Pico brewer that I enjoyed the system, I think I would maybe just buy my IPAs at my local brewery or liquor store and maybe now, so what's in this keg is the stout that I'm making. That'll be the next one. I will do a video on tasting that. I have more hopes for that because it's gonna be a bigger beer stronger flavors. If there's any kind of flavors in here that I'm not crazy about, I'm hoping that they will be uh, minimized or not as noticeable in a, in a you know, in a big uh, like seven or eight percent alcohol stout. So we'll see how that one comes out. I think I'm d more down on this than it sounds like from you guys. I I'm, I'm not particularly fond of this. I'm, I'm not crazy about it either, but I think a lot of the things I don't like are just fermentation issues. Maybe the way that the system boils it, or we don't know about that. <clears throat> um, it's got potential, but like you said, I do think we work out some bugs. It is a, a it is kind of a fun process. It's not, as you saw, uh, it's not super easy, but it's easier than doing a full uh, five gallons or even a, a extract and boiling two, three gallons on the stove. I mean, it's it's easier than that. 
um, but it's, uh, you know, not super hard to do it. All right. I think that about sums that up. We're going to keep rolling here. We're going to do a little more tasting. I didn't really want to necessarily worry about comparing it to the original um, model on camera because that wasn't my main goal here. But we'll, we'll do a little side by side and we'll check back in with the stout whenever that one is uh, packaged up. Catch you later.